village must have heard of Ipundulo, or he guessed they would have terror for any man with wings. More men and women came out of their huts, and old man said something I barely understood, something about he that comes at night. But they heard strange men were coming down the road, including a man white like clay, so they hid. They have been hiding for a long time now. Terror, the old ones say, used to come at noon, but now it comes at night, the old man said. He looked like an elder, but taller and much thinner, wearing earrings made of beads and a clay skull plate at the back of his head. A brave man with many killings who now lived in fear. His eyes two cuts in a face full of wrinkles. Marlon James, thank you so much. Now that was from Black Leopard Red Wolf, the first instalment of a trilogy dubbed The African Game of Thrones. <laughs> Hello to Booker Prize winning author Marlon James. Now the first book of your epic fantasy series, The Dark Star Trilogy has been translated into French as well as more than 20 other languages. Mm -hmm. It's set in ancient Africa and explores personal identity, the pursuit of truth, and the limits of power. Now, just by calling it the African <laughs> Game of Thrones made me desperate to read it. Oh my God, poor George. <laughs> Even George R. Martin eventually called me saying, I heard you're writing an African version of my book. <laughs> I was like, George, I just said that. It got it went viral. I'm not sure why. <laughs> describe it to us. Um, I forget Game of Thrones. I, it, I actually did describe it as that once, which is why that went viral. Um, it really is this sort of search and find mission that goes badly. A bunch of, you know, uh, mercenaries in a very ancient mythical Africa are given this job to find a missing child. And the book, Spoiler alert, the book tells you they botched the job and the child is dead. But the whole purpose of the book and the story is to figure out what happened and why. And in the trilogy, there are three characters and they, both get, they all give three different versions of the same story. You've written five books. You've won many, many prizes at this point. And your third book centered around the assassination attempt on Bob Marley. Mm -hmm. It was called A Brief History of Seven Killings. It won the Booker Prize in 2015. Mm -hmm. um, did that change your life? Oh, totally. Now when I say anything on, on <laughs> Facebook, it becomes a headline. Before, <laughs> nobody cared. <laughs> which is funny because the week before the Booker Prize, I had this scathing post about David Cameron, which would have gotten me in so much trouble the week after the Booker Prize. <laughs> um, but it did. It You know, one... I sold a lot more books, which is great. Um, it's always great when, you know, as an author, you start to see people recognize and appreciate your work. Um, and, you know, it created a, a sense of anticipation for this book, which I never had before. So there was a lot more pressure. And Salman Rushdie described you as one of the most important voices of your literary um, generation and an mm. author who must be read. Mm. Um, but for a while, the literary establishment and publishers, they weren't ready to hear you, even right. if um, the readers weren't, um, were. Your first book was rejected more than 70 times. Mm -hmm. You actually burnt the manuscript <laughs> of John Crow's Devil. What mm -hmm. made you keep going? Um, I didn't. I had not. I actually had. I gave up, actually. Um, and if, if it wasn't for my friend and mentor, Kaylee Jones, who's an American novelist, but I keep calling her French because she grew up here. You know, she pretty much gave me an ultimatum. She says, I'm not leaving this country until you give me the manuscript. <laughs> and she didn't know I burnt it. So I tried to find it. And of course, I couldn't. And I found it on an email drive on an old computer. I think it was Netscape. I didn't have enough paper to print it out. So I actually just chopped the first 20 pages and the last 20 pages without looking. Wow. And sent it to her. Well, clearly I didn't need them. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, she sent it to her publisher, Akashic Books, and they published my first book. And that's how, that's how my career started. And um, it was actually the film The Hobbit, mm -hmm. and it's all white cast, and that triggered you into writing um, mm -hmm. the Dark Star fantasy trilogy. Tell us more. You know, it's funny, because I'm such a, a huge fan of, our, of Tolkien. I actually gave the Tolkien lecture a few years ago. I saw the, the, the cast, and I just figured, why, why are we still doing this? Why can't it be more diverse? Nobody will care if somebody sees an Asian Hobbit. And my friend at the time was saying, well, you know, um, Lord of the Rings is about British mythology, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, dude, Lord of the Rings isn't real. You know, you can, certainly not. You know, Santa Claus isn't real. You can do what you want with these stories. We've always, that's the whole history of literature. 
we've always, you know, mixed and matched and barred from each other. And that just made me think, then why don't I just write something? Why, you know, take Toni Morrison, my, you know, my literary idol's advice, which is if you're not seeing a book, write it. So what about the new spin-off series of um, the Game of Thrones and Lord of the Rings, the Rings of Power and the House of the Dragon? Mm -hmm. Now, the richest family in Westeros mm -hmm. are black. Um, what do you think of the effort being put in to put more diversity on screen? I think it's admirable. I think it's a long time coming. I think there are people who think diversity is just an exercise. I'm like, yeah, but it's a good one. I don't have a problem with that. I think there is this idea, a right wing idea that diversity will get mediocre stuff. Like we're just picking people because they're black. We're just picking people because they're Asian or because they're gay. And you know, the funny thing is people, we forget just how mediocre things were before when it was only one type of person on screen, um, one type of story. Eventually that became pretty mediocre. I think diversity um, in itself brings about an excellence. I think there's this assumption that just because you hired somebody who's a woman, she's not as talented. And not realizing that that woman has had to work three times as hard as everybody else. If anything, she's too talented for that job. And for the trilogy, you delved into something like 5,000 years of African history mm -hmm. and folklore. Um, a lot of information that we have goes back to slavery. Right but not before. Right, right. Um, but writers and filmmakers are trying to look further back now. Mm -hmm. um, for example, with the film Woman King, right. Black Panther, there's a rich history that we know nothing about. Mm -hmm. It is rich, it's also complicated. And I think the more we learn and the more we embrace how complicated it is, like the Woman King story is pretty complicated because Dahomey was a pretty notorious slave empire. Um, where do we put that? The more we learn is the more uncomfortable it's going to be, but history is supposed to be uncomfortable. But it's, we become stronger from it. You know, we're, we're seeing all over Europe um, the consequences of people not knowing history. So we have fascism raising its ugly head again, because and the, nine, you know, and the 2020s starting to look like the 1920s. But I think history and knowing our history is a, a corrective to that. Something also very interesting, there's a huge queer atmosphere mm -hmm. in the book, um, characters are gender fluid. In 2022, there's a lot of homophobia mm -hmm. in Africa and in other places. But through the book, you're reclaiming an Africa that existed before, aren't you? Mm -hmm. Tell us more about that. Yeah, you know, I didn't go looking for it, actually. I had no intention of, of writing so many queer themes in the book. It was a research that led me to it. The, the further you go in the, the you know, even pre-colonial Africa, pre these African nations that are given European names, that um, there was space for queerness. There was space for multiple identities. Um, I used to say to black audiences, have you noticed you, how easy it is for you to call somebody them? Gender pronouns are not new. We think these things are new. We've been saying them for, for millennia. It's a homophobia that's new. The, the, the atmosphere in which different identities, different races, different colors, shapeshifters was always there. And um, it was in going looking for that that I found it. And, uh, and I found this weird kind of validation, actually, as a queer person, because I didn't think I would find it in the African continent. And that's exactly where I found it. And you write in English, mm -hmm. but not in standard, I guess we should call it the king's English. <laughs> it's a king now, it's yeah. The king. Um, you write in what the establishment might describe as broken English. Mm -hmm. um, how difficult has it been to get Jamaican English, to get African English um, accepted and appreciated as a rich language in its own right? The, you know, the, the, the problem with the term broken English is that it, imp it implies that it needs to be fixed. English language in itself came about because of a composite of so many different languages. Um, I can actually, I'm not going to do it here, but I can actually speak some Middle English. And if I did that, no English speaker would understand what I'm saying. Even if I were to recite a line in Shakespeare, speaking the English of people from Shakespeare, most people wouldn't, wouldn't even know. So language is always dynamic, language is always changing, and meanings are always changing. One of the things that happens with, with when we look at English as broken is things that are really just an aspect of another culture that are our original culture as we think is broken. Like there's no such word as went in Jamaican English. It's either he did go, he soon go, he won't go, he can go, even he going to go. And it turns out when you look at a language like Wolof, it's there. Lang verbs are always present. Action is always immediate. And there is something very dynamic about language when you think of an action is always happening. 
Um, so that is something that has survived Jamaican English, has survived Nigerian English. Our heritage have survived hundreds, if not thousands of years of colonization, conquest, whatever. The language won't be dimmed, it won't be destroyed. And that's, that's a triumph, I think. Now, the first book, Black Leopard, Red Wolf, has just been translated into French. Mm -hmm. You have already written the second one. It's called Moon Witch, Spider King. The mm -hmm. third one, you're about to start. A Brief History of Seven Killings was optioned for TV. Black Leopard, Red Wolf. Um, has Someone's bought the rights for mm -hmm. that as well. Um, one of the actors from uh, Black Panther. Where are you with the, the TV film situation? Oh, man, where are we? Um, well, COVID added two years to everybody's timetable. So for the adaptation for this, we're still pretty much in the writing stage. Um, turns out it's not that easy to adapt a book <laughs> to a screenplay. Who knew? <laughs> um, so we're still we're still at the writing stage. We have some very very talented people on board, and the the trick now is how do you turn a six hundred and twenty page book into uh, 112 page screenplay. Oh, we're looking forward to seeing it. We always end our show with, I guess, cultural pick mm -hmm. of the moment. What have you chosen for us? So I am really obsessed with um, this album, Topical Dancer, by Charlotte Adigieri and Bolis Pupil. And I've been listening to it all year. It's weird. I call it the most politically correct record I've ever heard. <laughs> and yet, one of the things, one of the biggest targets is political correctness. They, they just poke so much fun at it. Because it's so funny, it gets away with being so political. And then you can dance to all of it. We can. OK, thank you so much for joining. It's been a pleasure to have you in the studio. We're going to play out with the Belgian duo Charlotte Azigeri and Bolis Pupil. This is Ceci Nepin Cliché. They're going to be performing in Belgium at the end of the month. Thanks for being here. See you next time.